Uh, and that leads me in a way, uh, I've got a note about titles, about thinking about titles of creative works. And again, titles are enormously important to creativity. They're an objective. They're something you aim towards. You know, again, I'm talking principally about the kind of creativity I've been involved in, which is a solitary form of creativity. So this may not be necessarily as such help to people who want to work creatively in teams. But for me, as a solo creative worker, and I think often of, uh, I think it was uh, Yeats who said that the poetry was the social act of the solitary man, but how much more so the novel in which you tend to invent characters to be with you in your reclusion. Uh, and I was thinking about titles are something we aim towards. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a book at the moment called The Grey Nomads. I love that title. I want to publish a book called the Grey Nomads. So I wanted to publish a book called Phone, and before that, a book called Shark, and before that, a book called Umbrella. It's part of the kind of weird mission statement of what is essentially a corporation of one. So, not only are we a corporation of one, uh, but we are a corporation who are involved in a strange kind of path in the genesis. You know, it was it was Cocteau who said that all true artists, back to there and the biota here, he said all true artists are hermaphrodites because, I've used this image already, but here's where it comes from, uh, we're involved in a, a form of self-insemination and hence parthenogenesis. Uh, and, and, you know, the forms of our uh, insemination, as I say, are leading the imagination to the world and allowing the world to infiltrate uh, the imagination. And of course, the parthenogenesis, like any other pregnancy, the gestation, in a sense, takes place in private. Yeah, I know, you know, you have an ultrasound. I've, I've had four children of my own or been involved to a uh, yeah, I've had four, I've got four children of my own and I've, I've been to the ultrasound appointments and, uh, you know, which is an extraordinary moment, of course, and plenty of creative ideas to be drawn from the experience of the ultrasound, not just this particular image about creativity itself. But what I don't want is an ultrasound to be performed on the book I'm just stating. I don't want anybody to take a little wand and, and wave it over you know, for example, this is the typescript of my last book, and you know, I, I write on a manual typewriter for reasons that I'll uh, adumbrate in a moment. I don't want somebody to run an ultrasound over this and find out what's within it. Uh, and again, this this again brings me slightly at odds with the way creativity tends to be taught, even in respect of of, of literature, which is it tends to be done at a, at a kind of group level. For me real creativity occurs and the excitement of it is gestating my baby by myself, knowing that it's growing, that I'm involved in this secret communion with it, that I'm learning about it before I show its face to the world, you know, so that the mother and even in my experience, the father has that experience when the child is born. I remember it particularly vividly with one of my children because his head swiveled as he emerged, so his face went up, so he actually went the right way up uh, in, at the moment of birth and sort of introduced himself to me. We want that kind of eclat for our creative work. So for me, the gestation will take place in private. I never, ever share uh, anything I'm working on before it's completely done. And, and I think a lot of people who, find it hard to complete, complete creative work or to lead their creativity into the completion of works uh, could learn from that experience, along, of course, with the combinatorial experience of trying to get your ideas together. Just backtracking a bit to the combinatorial. Think about it. You know, I, I love what, um, you know, Roosevelt was, Franklin Roosevelt was meant to have said of Winston Churchill, he has 100 ideas a day. Uh, of which one is good. Okay, fine. He, he needed to have the 99 bad ideas in order to have the good one. He needed to spin the wheels 99 times, or probably 999 times, in order to get one of those combinations that was going to work for them, one gold mountain 
okay, that was going to play for him. So keep spinning. Uh, as I say, I don't like to, to show work in, in progress. And, and I believe that solitude enhances creativity. Uh, an absence from the Twitter sphere, certainly. You know, I remember reading a, a piece about an interview with Zodie, Zadie Smith when she completed her last novel, but one maybe saying that she'd downloaded a program to her computer that meant she was unable to access uh, the web while she was working. Now, for writers, this is quite an important thing, I believe. I mean, I, I, I long to be refuted on this. I'd love younger writers to come forward and say the presence of the web hovering behind, as it were, the pixelated blank page on their screen is not a distraction. But listen, I was writing and writing hard uh, when, uh, when the inception of... Uh, bi-directional, full inception of bi-directional digital media occurred around 2004 with wireless broadband. And even before then, you know, it was better because if you wanted to see something, you know, you're writing along, you know, you're working on something, you think she drove a, a Morris Traveller, which is an old style English car. You know, well, I'll Google that. Before wireless, you, you had to 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 sign up to a dial-up dial connection. You had to listen to it go, before you get your answer. That was enough to stop it. Now it's instantaneous. And I think that has, is having a big impact on people's creativity because I think it's encouraging an idea, not combinatorial, but literal, that, that the web offers you the signified, as Saussure would put it, to loop back to one of my earlier notes. You can tell I'm reading Saussure at the moment. Uh, it will give you the signified and your, uh, your job is only to find uh, the signifier. And I, I think that's a complete mistake. And of course, if you know your Saussurean linguistics, it makes no sense in terms of that either, since both signifier and, and signified are relational rather than absolute. So, you know, you call the Morris Traveler up on the web and then when you write, you describe the Morris Traveller you're seeing on the screen. You're not thinking in words about a Morris Traveller, which is what literature essentially is, just as painting a picture is thinking in paint, thinking in the capabilities of paint. You know, it was said of Eric Gill that he could freehand carve in stone. He must have seen in a block of stone the eventual image the, 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 uh, that he wanted to, to, to chip out of it. Uh, and, I, and I say, to get back to that kind of torturous idea of inspiration, uh, and I'm sure those of you out there who have, and probably most of you have, who have made creative works have had this feeling. If you're pleased with your creative work for a moment, it feels like the poem or the book is a reduction of all language. You've chipped it out as Gill chipped the statue out of the block or the bass relief out of the entire body of language. You've extracted these pigments and these brush strokes out of the whole possibilities of paint in that way. But we need isolation for this. Uh, and in literature, we need, I think, to do things that enhance uh, this engagement with the world that comes in this isolated way. You know, so for writing, I do things like what I would call the equivalent of a painter doing plein air composition. Uh, I go out and I describe things on the page in the street. I go and sit on, I used to before the pandemic, I used to go and sit on the tube a lot, and this is a rather edgy thing to do, and describe in words the people sitting opposite me. Quite a hard job. Have you ever noticed in literature you know, too much description is a bad thing. You don't want your readers to, to have an indelible idea of a face. You want them to bring some of their own creativity to what you've supplied them with. You know, a good bit of writing is a sense of recipe for somebody else's imagination and creativity. It's a way of unlocking it for them. But on the other hand, you want enough. So you're always trying to find the just phrase to describe a face uh, that is original, that is striking, and yet is exact and the same goes for all sorts of descriptive writing a uh, big problem for writers is also dialogue but it's a very good way of fostering creativity i think and when i have 
at all dared to essay teach, teaching people writing. I said, go and earwig. Again, it gives you a kind of edgy feeling. You're a sort of spy. You're a spy on a creative mission. Go and sit in a, in a kind of restaurant or uh, in, in a cafe and just earwig. Copy down what you can hear. Uh, and for a start, it's extraordinary how disjointed most people's speech is, how they run their words together, how full of likes and you knows and do you know what I mean and other nonce words and expressions it is. Uh, but it's also good for your creativity. It, it takes you out to the world from that strange position uh, of solitude, of being wrapped up in your own creative mission in that world. So I think exercises like that can be very important. Back to the notebook, the interplay between the notebook and whatever you're working on. Again, I'm now talking principally in terms of literature is profound. I have a whole process of how I get stuff from here into this, which is the completed typescript of uh, my last book. And actually, I haven't got a copy of the book to hand, but how it ends up as a published book. And it involves lots more stages. Uh, you know, for years, I used to know ideas down on these little post-it notes of this particular size, because they were peculiarly useful for getting a, uh, a factoid or a single metaphor or a single word on. And I actually used to stick them up on the walls of my writing room. And if you go online, there's a photographer called Phil Gray, who did a 360 degree view of my old writing room. Sadly, I, I've moved from there a few years ago when it had almost reached maximum wall coverage with post-it notes. But again, part of the solitude, part of the reflexivity of the creative life. When I looked around the walls of this writing room, all in a sense I could see was my own observations and ideas staring back at me. So I was in a sense already inside my own inchoate creative work. And then I organized them, having noted them all down to begin with, put them up on the walls of the writing room. They then, as it were, come down into these working books that would be categorized with the different categories of ideas, images, and metaphors in the book. And then I would post them onto the pages like that. So they were accessible to me in a different order in relation to the time scale of the novel, in relation to different characters. And again, they could be anything. They could be images, similes, metaphors, uh, things I'd seen, locations, descriptions of characters, whatever. Uh, there they go. And then I'd bring them down still further into my daily writing book. I write first draft longhand where they go in these fat margins. I can put them in the fat margins uh, and you know you can see I've crossed out the stuff I have written. Then it gets typed up into a, several fair copies. I won't bore you with that process. What I'm trying to convey to you is the way that the creative process, the process of creating the works is imbricated geared in to the actual praxis of getting it down on the page. So, you know, there are no technological solutions to creative problems, but what, you know, going back to my combinatorial image, what I'm trying to convey to you is that creativity is a bizarre form of uh, technology itself. If you think of technology to follow Marshall McLuhan as affecting action at a distance. And of course, you know, back to my image of the recipe in writing, you're trying to affect somebody else's uh, imagination at a, at a great distance. And you know, I've still got ideas that I'm thinking about working with that I put onto that wall in that writing room ages ago. I remember the thriller writer Ian Rankin once coming around and seeing a single post-it note I'd put up, uh, which just said on it, Haydn's nasal polyp. He said, what's that about Haydn's nasal polyp? I said, well, I was reading this book about uh, Hunter, the early surgeon, uh, and it was talking about how he once almost operated on Haydn when Haydn visited London for a nasal polyp. Uh, and I was thinking about, well, maybe Haydn as a composer would have a particularly acute uh, internal hearing, listening to the kind of 
sound of wind whistling through his orifices and that he might have noticed the presence of the, the nasal polyp through some alteration in the timbre of his own breathing, which might have affected one of his myriad famous symphonies. Maybe he'd secretly titled one of his symphonies the Polyp Symphony. Uh, so I was thinking of writing a short story about that. I haven't yet, but nothing, and this is one of my key uh, dictums on the matter, matter of creativity, the one thing, and this is the great thing about the technology of creativity, the one technology that is not subject to the second law of thermodynamics, which is that all open systems incline towards entropy, is the technology of creativity. Nothing is lost in the economy of ideas. It's all just swirling around there. If it's not going to make a novel, it might be an idea that comes to you and says, I'm a short story. It might be an idea that comes to you and says, I'm a traditional folk dance in Tajikistan, which would be an extraordinary donne, but you should follow your creative inclinations at that point and immediately choreograph just that folk dance. So this brings me, because I'm conscious of time, we've talked about parthenogenesis, we've talked about the combinatorial, we've talked about, in a way, being open. I always remember... Uh, my my creative mentor, Jim Ballard, J.G. Ballard, saying of William Burroughs that Burroughs wasn't so much a writer, you know, top-down writer who was in control of the creative process. It was rather that he had opened his imagination. And in Burroughs's case, probably through the large-scale use of hallucinogenic drugs, he'd sort of opened his imagination out as a kind of test bed in which he ran strange sorts of creative experiments and then just wrote down his notes on those experiments. So I've talked about that, talked about that openness. Uh, and, you know, to say a little bit about originality, as I said at the beginning, you know, originality often can get in the way of our creativity. Uh, I think solitude helps. I think the, 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 the gestation in private helps because it means You've got to produce the whole work before you critique it in terms of whether it has any originality or viability. Whereas if you're constantly second guessing it and showing it to other people, you're stymied, you're hamstrung before you get there. So that's one thing. The other thing is though to recognize is there is very little originality in creative work, very little. Uh, I think it was Evelyn Waugh who said of writers, at best they've got one original work in them, possibly two two's maybe pushing it and that's the best writers you know uh, i think it was Auden who wrote in in the margins of of uh, of books that he particularly liked passages of g-e-t-s gets which was his acronym for good enough to steal uh, and i think it's a, an adage of the creative life again particularly applied to literature that you know as it were good writers steal bad writers borrow by which i mean that you uh, you aren't detected in what you've purloined. So I don't think you should have that kind of anxiety of influence, to quote uh, the famous title of Howard Bloom's, Harold Bloom's uh, critical work. And of course, Bloom's idea was that it was the misinterpretation of one's influences that, that constituted a kind of creativity. And arguably, he was, of course, just a misinterpreter of Freud. But don't get me started on that, the relationship between creativity and psychoanalysis, although it is helpful. Think of it as, in a way, the free association of the combinatorial uh, function in that way. Again, for literature, uh, you know what, what the French situation is called the derive kind of never fails, the aimless stroll, the journey. All journeys are on, of necessity narratives. And they're usually picaresques. You normally meet somebody along the way to provide you with vignettes. Now, I'm not a believer as a, a kind of neo-modernist, as I've been called. Uh, I'm not particularly a believer in the idea that either we've all got a story in us to tell or that we are constituted by that story. I think that kind of emphasis on narrative is, is driven by a creative era typified by a slavish belief in content rather than style. Uh, and I'm of the Sontagian fraternity. I think style takes precedence. Uh, but I would say that if you're creatively blocked in any way, get out of the house. Back to plain air composition. Take that walk. Describe where you've been. Take notes. 
keep taking the notes. Just take them as anybody would take a pill because you've always got that notebook with you. And don't worry too much about the originality at that point. Any creative person who is honest with themselves and looks back at a work they've created will see immediately the influences that are upon it and will probably reel back from their plinth, their canvas, their page, their computer screen, going, oh my God, I've done it again. I've, I've been influenced by so-and-so, I've responded to so-and-so. It was true of Picasso, trust me. Picasso didn't stand there looking at Guernica thinking this is an overpowering work of originality and creativity. He stood there seeing the influences upon it, whatever he felt them to be. So try not to worry uh, about that too much. Uh, and instead, enjoy suspending your own disbelief. You know, enjoy, if you're a writer, telling yourself the story you're writing, dividing yourself into two, and quite self-consciously thinking of half of yourself as the writer and the other half of yourself as the reader. That's very important for when you go back over stuff, but it's equally important to keep yourself engaged with the work and keep the excitement and frisson that should be attendant upon it in time for the grand reveal. And of course, the same could be true of a painting or, or any other kind of work that you do uh, in isolation in that sense. 